Okay, so thanks. First, I'd like to just thank the organizers for uh, the chance to speak here. Um, I'm going to tell you about some work based on these uh, series of three papers that have been written in uh, collaboration with uh, my advisor, Saf Sethi, uh, Mark Stern from, from Duke, and Alarian, who's in the audience here. Um, so here's a quick outline. Uh, I'll briefly go through some motivation and, and review of the, the main tools we're going to use, which is the uh, gauge linear signal model. Uh, then I'll explain how you can incorporate HFLUX into the GLSM construction. Uh, we'll go through some, some simple examples and then uh, a sort of more interesting class where we have kind of anomalous B fields. Um, so along the way, we'll see some, a puzzle and a, a kind of a resolution of it, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, so I'll try to go through this part pretty quickly because uh, I think I have put too many slides in. So um, if it's not, if I'm going too fast, I'll just shout out and, uh, and then I'll try to go over things a bit more. Uh, more slowly. So the, the goal is we really want to find generic solutions to, with, of heterotic string theory that preserve n equal 1 supersymmetry in space-time. So we want some sort of Minkowski cross some compact six manifold. So to reserve uh, supersymmetry, we have to solve the 10-dimensional uh, killing spinner equations, um, which Stromager showed way back in, in the 86 that this is equivalent to some conditions on M. That it, so M has to be a complex manifold with some covariant the constant holomorphic three form. And then there's a fundamental form, which is related to the metric, which if, if it was closed would be the killer form, but in general it won't be. Um, so then they, they, that satisfies these relations that so the, the H flux is determined in terms of the killer form like this. Um, and the dilaton and, and, these, and the three form are, are uh, closed sort of in, in, this, in this way. And then the, so the, the gauge field has to satisfy these hermitian yang nels equations. So in addition to these uh, SUSY constraints, we also have to impose the uh, heterotic Bianchi identity, which relates these um, second churn classes. Um, now, if, if, if you just take this, a, a, a very non-generic uh, example where, where the H is identically zero, um, then if you look, start, look at this for a little bit, do you see that the the only way you can really do it is by, by having all of these things uh, be, be closed forms. And you really need to in identify the, the gauge field with the spin connection. And of course, then you end up with the Klabiao solution. Now, if you want to relax this a little bit, so say that H isn't exactly 0, but it's, it's sort of 0 at tree level, and there's some alpha prime corrections, then you sort of relax these conditions a little bit as well, and you don't need to quite identify these anymore. Um, but still, the solution is sort of Klabiao plus alpha prime. Uh, corrections. Um, but this is not the generic ca uh, case, right? The generic case is going to have an H which is, which is order one. Um, and this is going to typically freeze your cycles to sort of be at sort of alpha prime scale. Uh, the reason being that you have this now relation uh, from here and here th that um, uh, on, the right, on the right hand side, uh, the, this side is, not, is, is scale invariant under conformal transformation to the metric, uh, while the left hand side um, uh, would scale, but so so basically, it's, it's, it's telling you that that some some pieces of the metric here have to be f um, fixed, That's, and the only scale in the problem really is, is alpha prime. So, um, so you have some some small cycles, and, and you, you can't trust supergravity anymore. Um, right, so this is just sort of repeating what I said. Generically, you'll have h order one. You'll have fixed cycles. You can't trust supergravity. This is basically why the only solutions that are really known to date. Uh, are this, uh, were found by uh, Dasgupta, Rajesh, and Sethi, and they basically look like uh, elliptic fibers over, over K3, um, where there's some H flux th threading some piece of the fiber in, in the base. So, so where are the, generically though, we expect some huge landscape of, of solutions. So where, are, where is the sort of heterotic landscape of n equal 1 solutions? Um, well, you're not going to be able to find it using supergravity. You really have to construct it somehow in the, with a 0, 2 superconformal field theory. Uh, 0, 2 because we want to preserve n equal 1 in space time. So constructing these things is generically very hard to do. Um, fortunately, there's, there's a, an alternative way, to, which is to use the gauge linear sigma model. Uh, and then you could get a non-trivial um, SCFT as some infrared fixed point of, of the RG flow. Uh, so it's a lightning review of the of the gauge linear sigma model. Um, we're really just we'll just try to focus on the bosonic components so as not to complicate notation too much. 
Um, basically, you just have some charged scalars interacting with some, by some potential coupled to gauge fields, uh, and you may include some uh, topological term for the gauge field. So the scalar potential has some three terms. There's a, there's a D term, uh, and then the, there's a, there's a e term called E and J. So this E is related to the bundle, basically, and the J is a 0 to super potential. Uh, Supersymmetry bands that, that E and J, and then this complex combination of these parameters theta and, uh, and the Fi parameter, that all these, these three quantities all have to appear holomorphically in the theory. Okay, so how, how can you um, engineer a, a, non a, you know, a conformable nonlinear sigma model? Well, so suppose you want to study the low energy behavior of this GLSM. So at low energies corresponds to taking this gauge coupling to infinity because remember in two dimensions the gauge coupling has positive mass dimension. So infrared dynamics is going to be equivalent to sending E to infinity. Uh, and then I also want to look at the minimum energy configurations, which is sort of set at lying at V equals zero, and I should divide by this gauge group. So my the target manifold should be this, this vacuum manifold. And in particular, it can go even further. Um, in this limit, um, the gauge field really just appears here as a non-dynamical field. So you can solve its uh, equations motion exactly, and you just get some solution in terms of the scalar fields. Now, if I plug that into the remaining parts of the action, um, these kinetic terms give me a kind of a metric on, on my uh, vacuum manifold. And this topological term becomes like a B field coupling in the sigma model. Uh, and, and, and zero to supersymmetry guarantees that G and B are related. And they're both derived from um, kind of one form K, which is the zero to analog really of, of a Kähler potential. Um, and the fact that they're related in this way guarantees that this relation that we saw from um, the spinner constraint, the, the Strominger system, um, that that H is related to the fundamental form in the prescribed way. Actually, in this case, it's a little bit trivial because uh, for all these examples, B is actually a closed form. So H is H and, and the is, is, is zero, and the, fun, you know, the fundamental form, the Kähler form, is, is closed. So the, all these spaces are really Kähler. And if I impose this condition that the sum of the charges of the, of the fields vanish, then it's actually going to be a Calabi-Yau solution. Um, so we didn't talk about uh, the fermions at all. I mean, the, well, the right movers are just fixed by SUSY. The left movers determine my bundle. And we're not really going to be worried too much about the bundle. But we're more interested, really, in the, in the geometry and the H flux. So we won't really uh, talk about these left movers too much. Um, depending on the choice of, of F, though, I mean, basically, this will either give an in infrared solution after I do this RG flow to the um, SCFT, I'll either have H being zero or order alpha prime, uh, depending on the choice of, of my bundle. Um, the, on, the only thing we really care about uh, the left movers is that um, they satisfy this anomaly uh, condition that the, basically the, the E1 gauge anomaly should vanish. OK, so these, all, these, these are not the generic solutions that I was advertising. So how do we get um, the generic solutions where, where H is order one? Um, so the idea is, well, if B basically looks like um, theta f, then if we, t if we promote theta to be some field-dependent quantity, then I'll, then I'll get a non-vanishing um, H flux. So because of holomorphy, we're required to do the same thing for R. So really, we have some, some holomorphic uh, field-dependent quantity you know, called capital T, which has some real and imaginary parts, um, big theta, big R. Um, so th this kind of construction is known in Tutu, where, where the, the, but these, these t's have to depend on um, the sigma field, which is the, it's a scalar partner of the gauge field in Tutu, basically coming from dimensional reduction from four dimensions. Um, but what we're, we're going to do is consider cases where these phi fields that appear in, uh, in my field-dependent sort of fi parameters are now are going to be charged fields, this is something you could only really do in zero two. Uh, so gauge invariance sort of re requires though that this T would be some gauge invariant combination of fields. And combined with holomorphy, that means I could only really do this when I have both positive and negatively charged fields. So this is, if you've studied these things before, you'll, you'll know that this sort of requires that my space be non-compact. Basically, I have a sort of D term 
where it, that depends on these difference of charges. So I can always, I can go at, you know, along this moduli space uh, arbitrarily far. So here's just a really quick example. I won't go through the details of this too much. I mean, just take the a couple, two fields of positive charge and two with negative charge. Um, so the, the vacuum manifold takes this form. Um, if R were zero, this would be the conifold. But for R finite, this is uh, some result conifold. And you can just, the simplest thing is just take a, a T, which is quadratic, sort of bilinear in the positive and negatively charged fields. Um, and now uh, this D term constraint gets modified to depend on the, instead of a constant R, and have this field dependent quantity. And okay, so you can, well, you can go through the story and, and work out what the metric is. It's just some deformation of the usual conifold metric. The important thing that for us is that it depends on this, this, this basically determined by this one function f that I've written here. Um, the thing we're really interested, I really want to show you is that um, you can work out what the, what the h flux is in this, ca in this case. Um, and it basically takes this product form of you know, d theta wedge f, where f is determined by this little function f. It gives you some non-trivial uh, two-form in the space. However, the, the theta was, was some gauge invariant quantity. So um, it's going to be globally defined on, on my target space. So in particular, d theta is exact. And so h just integrates up to, to something vanishing. So I have a non-zero h, but it's kind of tri it's trivial in cohomology. It's, so it's not, not very interesting. Um, and this is sort of related to the fact that these t's uh, are continuously deformable parameters. And so um, I'm not changing the class of H in an interesting way. So, yeah. so what we really want to do is get a kind of quantized H. These are, would be the sort of interesting solutions that you have in string theory. So how can you do that? Well, there's another possibility, which is to, be, which is to instead of having um, sort of polynomial behavior, you can put in something like a, a logarithm of a field. So now this theta is going to depend on the phase of um, that field that I have. So if I do this kind of uh, global 2 pi phase rotation, then um, this, this term in the action is now going to shift. And because of the quantization of the gauge field in two dimensions, um, I basically get, uh, so, 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 so this, the action shifts by this amount. And if I require that the path integral be uh, single valued basically puts a quantization condition on this coefficient n that I had here. Um, now, having sort of these kind of log couplings appear in the action is a bit uh, problematic, I guess, if to really well to, to find the theory well. Um, but you know, you know, sort of used to ex from experience, you sort of see logs sort of emerge as some effective field theory description when you integrate out some massive degrees of freedom. So. The goal I wanted to show now is how to, how to, how to generate these logs from some UV complete description. Okay, so a good pl starting place is, is just, take the, just take the standard 2 2 CPN model. So I have um, n plus 1 ch um, fields, I'll, I'll charge 1, it's a neutral scalar. So this is the guy related to the gauge field. Um, this is my d term potential and these e couplings that I referred to before. Um, the fact that sigma is related to, to A means that basically this, these are going to be some universal couplings. Um, sigma sort of couples universe, the same to all the phi's. Um, now, if I look, you know, the standard construction, I'm sure you guys have seen, so I won't belabor this. Um, you know, the vacuum manifold is just CPN. Okay, so, but now, now if we relax this to, to a zero two situation, you no longer have to have this, we're no longer forced to have these, this potential coupling for sigma. Um, so consider the following thing instead. So let me, instead of having it coupled to all the phi's, let me just couple it to one of the phi's, say phi zero. So now there's a new branch of solutions for the vacuum manifold where, where I can give sigma of vev, and that's going to give a mass to phi zero, right? And so then on that branch, I can integrate out phi zero um, and just have a, a description in terms of sigma and the, and the remaining phi's. Okay. When you do that, what you find is you get exactly this kind of uh, logarithmic coupling for sigma. Uh, in addition, there's some metric correction for the kinetic terms of sigma. So this gives you exactly the right kind of um, structure we were looking for, where the coefficient n is now fixed by the charge of the, the field that we integrated out. Okay, 
So now, so, so now we have, so what does is, what is this vacuum structure look like? Well, it's basically another P1 for the phi's, but now instead of having a fixed radius, it's going to, the radius is going to be some, vary as I move along the sigma direction. Um, so this is the, the metric ends up taking this form. So here's basically the, some Fubini study metric on Pn um, with some sort of complicated behavior for the, the r and theta directions. And there's, there's an h flux um, that depends on this Kähler form of, on the, of the Pn and going around this theta direction. But now, it, as, as I uh, had advertised, we're getting a quantized h because basically the state is now periodic with period 2 pi n. Just an artifact of the fact that you wrote the kinetic term as d sigma over sigma. No, no. So that, that's just the, the, that's a correction to the uh, kinetic term, which basically is giving you this correction here. So there's there's still there's still this whole thing as well. Yeah. Um, right. So the fact that I, I'm getting an integral of h, which is giving me some integer. For any value of r, it's basically telling me that I have what I have is a stack of ns brains sitting at the origin here at r equals zero. Uh, I he hesitate to call them ns five brains because this isn't really a conformal solution, so I wouldn't want to necessarily identify them with the five brain solutions. But they're a kind of, you know, magnetic source for h flux in this case. Uh, and, and, and now this point r equals zero is really is a Coulomb branch because that's where all these phi's uh, are forced to vanish. So, so really, so the picture is, is sort of like this. Um, I have this r direction, and here I have over r at every point I have uh, some pn, and the pn is getting smaller until I hit the origin, uh, and then at that origin there's this Coulomb branch where the ns5 brain, or so the ns brain, emerges. Okay. Okay. So, um, some quick comments about this space. Um, so you'll notice that that the solution doesn't is it totally independent of theta because there's no real notion of a B field anymore once I have a, a non-trivial H. Um, you'd sort of, ex since theta doesn't really appear in the solution, you sort of expect the same thing would happen for R. Uh, and indeed, at least if you focus if you, on either of two limits, either taking R to zero or taking N to infinity, then you see that this, the only R dependence here drops out. Uh, and sort of in this, so you have this kind of near horizon limit um, where, where you don't have any tunable moduli. Sort of Everything is just fixed in terms of this discrete parameter n. Um, it sort of suggests that under RG flow, uh, th that's exactly you, this term would sort of drop out, and you would just be left with um, uh, this latter term, which is no tunable moduli, which is sort of what you expect uh, in a in a flux compactification. Sort of. Okay. Um, now th this example is is not conformal, so there's really no no real IR fixed point, um, but we'll see the same kind of thing happen in a conformal model. I might have to go through a little bit quickly. Um, ah, so this is just say, so in, in this large n limit, the metric really simplifies a lot. Um, now you might be worried about this singularity r, r equals zero, so it's but it's natural to sort of t dual lies along this theta direction there, uh, and then the t dual metric just looks like an orbifold, where the h flux has been replaced by this kind of twist charge. Um, so it's really just you know. Although it looks like a bad singular behavior, uh, at least in string theory, this is a pretty well behaved. Not, not too, it's, mi it's only mildly singular, really, in string theory. Okay, so, so let me go through this conformal example very quickly. Just take two, two fields, say, charge plus and minus one. Um, so there was this condition from the Dilatino variation, um, which I could equivalently rewrite in terms of this so called uh, Lee form, which is, basic, which is determined in terms of h and, uh, and the metric in this way. Uh, and this requirement that, that from the Diltino variation vanishing just tells me that this Lie form should be given by the gradient of the scale of the Dilaton. Well, if you if you take this example and run through compute what this what this quantity is, you see that it's only exact if I take this large n limit. So let's just start there for now. We'll take this large n limit um, to find some notation. I'll let, find y to be this gauge invariant combination of fields on n, and label. Um, this R direction is Y3. Then you see that the metric that comes out is really is just conformal to R3, R3 cross S1, where the conformal factor is just given by this uh, harmonic function on R3, which I, you can identify with 
the string coupling. Uh, and then there's an H which sort of wraps the, the, the S1 direction and, the S, and an S2 sitting inside of this R3. So really, this is, this is the, the solution for a large number of NS5 brains um, smeared along some transverse S1. So note that it's because this is a, uh, should be a conformal solution, I can actually talk about it. It makes sense to talk about a diloton uh, in, the, in, the, in this case. Uh, and we sort of conjecture that, so this only emerged at large n, in the large n limit, but you, so you can sort of conjecture that this, is, this would be the endpoint result for a finite value of n uh, after you do this RG flow. Okay, um, still have a bit of time, so I want to get to this uh, interesting class of, of solutions where you have a set of anomalous B-fields. Uh, so let's return to this uh, deformed CPN model where we, we said we sort of deformed our, the, off this 2-2 locus to have um, just sigma coupling to phi zero in this way. Of course, in 2-2 in we required that sigma be neutral because it was related to the gauge field, but there's really no reason for that to be the case in the general 2-2 setting. So, so what if I have a sigma were to have some non-zero charge? So what happens? Well, the first thing is that it now it ought to appear in the D-term constraint. Um, but now when we integrate it out, um, so if sigma has non-zero, then so we integrate out phi zero again, something very interesting is going to happen. Let me see. Um, okay, so I get the same kind of correction terms, except now I have some covariant derivatives for sigma, but otherwise it's the same kind of log couplings for these fi parameters. Right, but now we see something very strange, right, because sigma's charged, and so under a gauge transformation, the action is now going to shift by the, this amount here. So how is this possible? We started with a well-defined gauge invariant theory. Um, we integrated out some, some fields, and we ended up with a, a non-invariant action. Well, this, this action takes a very special form because it looks exactly like the, the kind of variation you'd have from a 2D gauge anomaly. Well, what's happening, uh, in addition to this scalar potential, Susie sort of pairs it with, there's a, there's a corresponding Yukawa coupling between left and right movers. So when sigma gets some VEV, these lambda and psi, they pair up to form some massive Dirac fermion. And so they should be integrated out along with this phi zero field. Right, but now with, when, since sigma has a charge, now these lambdas and psi's are going to have, won't have the same, will no longer have the same charge, or, or opposite charge, I suppose. Uh, so when I integrate them out, I'm left with an anomalous spectrum in the infrared. Um, in particular, I have an anomaly coefficient which exactly cancels, balances um, the, the coefficient from um, this, this variation such that the total anomaly, when I, the total uh, theory, when I combine this quantum anomaly and this classical variation of S, the whole thing stays invariant. So this is sort of a, a similar situation to what's uh, the, the, this kind of balancing that uh, has appeared in work by uh, Adams, uh, Ernberg, and LePan. Um, I should also say that th this, this feature of, of um, having, starting with you know, a well-defined gauge invariant theory and you know, uh, integrating out some anomalous spectrum and, and being left with this kind of cancellation uh, was, was shown up in the uh, work of um, Doker and Fari, from, you know, they, where they studied what happens if you integrate the top quark out. Uh, you get left with some effective theory that's anomalous, but then there's some corresponding uh, non-gauge invariant terms which, which, which balance things out. Okay, so there's a little puzzle, though, if you start thinking about some of these models. So let me just run through this quickly, where you have, you have uh, suppose you have two field, two phi fields, all charge one, and the, the sigma field. Um, so you can ask, what's the solution space? Well, again, you sort of have this situation where it looks like a PN. Well, you have sort of a phi squared being set to some field-dependent um, radial direction. Um, so now you can, it's easy to see, though, where this left-hand side is, is strictly positive. So uh, as I take sigma very large, eventually I can ignore the, when sigma's large, I can ignore the log term, and then basically uh, sigma is bounded by, by r. Uh, on the other hand, what if it takes sigma very small, I can neglect this term, but then the log sort of has to um, balance out this r piece. And so sigma's bounded to lie in some finite interval. And in particular, at these endpoints, 
um, the size of the, these phi spaces is shrinking to zero. So what is that space? Well, what is, what's that space? Well, these phi's are basically carving out some um, S3 that's being fibered over this interval, and it's collapsing at the two endpoints. Right? So that's, that space is just S4. Um, but there's a problem with that, right? Because S4 is not a complex manifold. And it's known that there's no complex structure possible or even almo almost complex structure uh, possible uh, on S4, which is in, you know, in contradiction with supersymmetry. So what's going on? Um, to see that, well, the point is it's not sufficient just to look at this D term equation. You really need to look at the metric that's, going, that's on this target space. Um, if you, so you run through the same kind of construction that I outlined before. You compute a, a metric in H flux. And what you find is that these quantities depend very strongly on the, on the sort of local coordinates I choose, which sounds very funny. I mean, the metric should be just some invariant quantity measuring you know, distances and such. So how, can, how is that possible? Well, the answer has to do with the fact that in string theory, we all know that in the heterotic string, the B field is actually anomalous under, under uh, space-time yang mills and Lorentz symmetries. And the, the correct quantity is not just dB. So the correct invariant uh, field strength is really this H, which is dB plus some turn simons corrections. And what the reason we saw this variation of H is that we were just considering this le leading piece without the correct uh, corrections to it. Now, so if B is going to have some anomalous transformation, and we said that in 0, 2, G and B are, are derived from some common quantity, some kind of Kähler potential, well, then it has to it be the case. If B has anomalous variations, then so will the metric. So that's, that's, this is the sort of origin of this um, anomalous transformations of the metric. Um, so when you compute this effective action uh, for the low energy theory, we, you have a choice of counter terms you can include. And you can either preserve 0 to supersymmetry, which is something we were doing and getting this funny behavior for G, or you can break manifest 0 to supersymmetry and, and write them, but, uh, have the metric be invariant. Uh, so when you include the there's a counter term you can add to the me that um, makes the, keeps the metric invariant. So this this whole thing is uh, breaks manifest zero two, but it still um, satisfies zero two on shell. Um, this a is, is is determined by the solution to the gauge field that I, uh, from the beginning of the talk. Uh, so then that, that this, now this invariant metric g hat um, is invariant under under choices of uh, different um, choices of coordinates. And, and it takes this uh, not very enlightening form. Um, but I mean, there it is. Uh, and you can, so, so the thing is, to, to, this, to this metric g hat, you can associate an h flux in the usual way, by just by this d minus d bar of j. And it turns out that it, it looks like db plus a piece that looks very much like a Chern-Simons kind of correction, expressed in terms of these. Um, a fields. OK, so what's, what's happening with this S4? Well, the metric, you can see, actually becomes singular when this R um, hits this value of A over 8 pi. Um, what's happening is that there's, so in the S4, remember, we, we, we saw it as a S3 fibered over an interval, so that the, the S1, so the hop fiber inside of S3 is really is, is diverging here while the remaining S2 sort of shrinks to a, a finite radius at this point, R. Um, so you can check that the singularity is actually at finite distance in the radial direction. So it sort of gives at least a partial resolution to what's happening. And, and that is that this S4 is actually really cut in half. You don't have S4. It's really just a four-dimensional disk and there's a, with a singular boundary. Now, I mean, that's only really a partial resolution because it just sort of pushes the question away from how is this consistent with supersymmetry to what's going on at this singular boundary? And unfortunately, this is still something we're not uh, entirely certain of and still looking into. Uh, one, one sort of hint is that um, our, as you approach this boundary, the, this field sigma is coming very small. And remember, sigma is setting the mass for this, um, this extra field phi zero that we integrated out to generate these logs. So uh, it's sort of hinting that maybe we're, mis we're, we're sort of the singularity is related to some light degrees of freedom that we've integrated out. So this is something that we're looking into right now. Um, okay, so these are my conclusions. I'm probably out of time, so let me just I'll put those up there for you to read. And thank you.
have a comment and a question. Comment is it's very beautiful. It's very Thanks. Cool. And uh, the, the origin of this low charge log interactions and FI dependent, uh, field dependent FI parameters mm -hmm. is very analogous to twisted superpotential in 2.2 yeah. mm -hmm. So why would in, in a paper you actually say that for emphasizers? Why you never even mention it? Whereas this is morally. Um, did we, I think we, I think we may have hinted toward, uh, indicated that. I mean, yeah, it, it, the, this this example I have where we sort of start with a two-two CPN model, say, and deform. I mean, that's really that's. I mean, if you just had the two-two model, you could you could do the same integrating out and do, produce similar logs. Um, that's true. I guess the the thing that's different here is that you can have charged fields appearing now in the logarithms, and this is. Right, but then as you explain in the paper, since you want something non-anomalous, you can actually add things back and see how they produce this charge log interaction concentration. But anyway, the question is, let me try to think about non abelian Um in it's sort of in this similar kind of setup? Um, very briefly. I mean, not not in any serious amount, but I do know that from what from what I've seen in in the sort of analogous Docker Fari type situations in 4D. You're going to end up with uh, pretty nice. There would be a nice structure with a sort of West Amino terms entering for the non-abelian theory, which you wouldn't have for the uh, abelian mm -hmm. case. So it's something that I've wanted to tackle in the future, but yeah, I want to understand this, uh, this simpler abelian case first. But definitely something I want to look at. Yeah. Okay. okay. Comment on the finite n conjecture. That I largely understand that we don't have pretty much one loop. Results, you just integrate out the fields, you get the result of expectation, but mm -hmm. why do you expect it to fall in finite? Well, the reason is so, do you, you sort of have two? I mean, from the supergravity point of view, at least, the, there's really kind of two constraints going on. One, you need, you need basically a, a first turn class of the space to, be, to vanish. Mm -hmm. But in addition, it looks, it looks as if there's an, an, an extra additional uh, piece where you need the dilettante. To come from this exact Lie form, um, and I guess the point is, you, you you sort of think that that just having one con one constraint should really be sufficient. I think, as long as, um, as long as, sorry. yeah, basically as long you know you, ha you have this condition that the sum of charges is vanishing, this should be sufficient to get a, a conformal solution. Now you can't to see the, to see this conformal solution, we really have to take this large n limit, right? But so what we're arguing is that okay, it won't look that that just means it looks conformal in the UV, right? But what we're arguing is that for at finite end, it won't look conformal. But then as you flow down, you'll you'll this Lie form will become exact uh, after after the RG flow. At the fixed point. Though. Yeah, at the fixed point, it would you would, would get an exact Lie form. So the the large end was just kind of a trick to to extract this this fact. Yeah, sorry, probably didn't explain that. Better. Well, maybe anxious to get to the keys, so perhaps we should leave for further discussion for a private. Just that. <laughs>